Earthling Ed is one of the most influential vegan activists of all time. He's inspired thousands of people to go vegan and become activists, including myself. But what is it about Ed that makes him so effective? More importantly, what can you learn from his approach? Whether you want to do street outreach, or if you just want to have better conversations about veganism with your friends and family, you're going to want to watch this video. Some people think Ed has a superhuman level of patience, or the fact that he looks like Jesus makes people listen to him. I just want to say I admire you so much oh. because of your patience. But in reality, Ed uses four simple techniques that you can easily adopt to become a better advocate for the animals. When you're challenging someone's long-held beliefs, it's essential to make them feel safe. If you're like me, you can remember having negative feelings toward vegans before you became one. You may have thought they were judgmental, preachy, or just plain wrong. People have the same impression of vegans, whether it's right or wrong, that were militant and dogmatic and extreme and all of these things. I used to think the same thing. So when I have conversations, I'm very much of the impression I don't want to perpetuate that. Ed goes against all these stereotypes by being non-threatening. The first way he shows he's not a threat is by giving out a quick compliment. It's lovely to meet you. Uh, thank you so much for sitting down and uh, having a conversation with me. It's important to remember that most people do not want to discuss veganism. So telling someone that you appreciate them talking to you is a great way to start the conversation on a positive note. The second way Ed makes people feel at ease is through his body language. You may have noticed that Ed always sits next to people during debates. He may just do this to get a better camera angle, but sitting next to someone as opposed to square makes them feel like they're already on your side. Arguing face to face makes people more combative, so avoid doing that whenever you can. Ed also displays open body language. When people are uncomfortable, they close themselves off physically. When you open up, you show that you have nothing to hide and signal to others that you're safe. An easy way to do this is to show your hands. If someone feels uncomfortable, they're more likely to become defensive and go into a state of cognitive dissonance than they are to be honest with you. If they're not being honest, it's unlikely that you'll be able to get them to a place where they change their mind. The second habit Ed uses to win debates is an attitude of curiosity. Be curious, not judgmental. As vegans, we may know more about animal agriculture than almost anyone we talk to, but we don't know anything about the person we're talking to. So when people sit down, you know, the, the camera operator will start moving the cameras, you know, checking the memory cards, checking the batteries. And we do that deliberately so that I have two or three minutes just to sit and talk to someone, not about veganism. Mm -hmm. You know, what do you study? Where are you from? Do you like it? This is an excellent practice, not only because you're building a connection, but also because you can learn how to influence people based on what their interests are. Another way to show curiosity is through active listening. Ed does this by nodding his head and saying, yeah, while the other person is making a point. You do realize yeah. that yeah. being yeah. able to have yeah. a word, right? right? Yeah. And have, yeah. Well, I... This shows them that you're not just sitting there waiting for your turn to talk and makes them feel heard. When someone finishes their point, Ed summarizes it back to them to make sure he's heard correctly. So yeah. just to summarize, the reason that Americans should eat meat is to try and stop China from invading America, because if Americans were vegans, they would be too weak to stop a communist invasion. This gives the other person an opportunity to correct you if you've mischaracterized their point. Ed's attitude of curiosity makes him a master of the Socratic method. He asks questions not only to understand the other person, but to help them understand themselves. You know, what does that say about the process and your feelings towards it if it's something you wouldn't actively want to participate in? Most people haven't given veganism much thought, and chances are they don't even know why they believe it's okay to exploit animals. By asking probing questions, you can allow them to explore their beliefs. However, asking probing questions can make people feel uncomfortable, so you need to ask them with a non-condescending tone. What does the circle of life mean? Because I guess the circle of life is really that, you know, we're born and we die. That's the circle, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. But the circle of life and the fact that death is inevitable doesn't necessarily, I don't believe anyway, provide justification for us to take life arbitrarily or, or without a necessity. Mm -hmm. Did you agree with well, that? You can hear the curiosity in Ed's voice when he asks these tough questions. An easy way to do this is to soften your voice and speak in a higher tone. So at this point, we've talked about how Ed puts people in a position where they're comfortable enough to change their views. Now let's talk about how he actually wins. I'm stumped right now. I, I, where you're coming from, you got the upper hand. I'm stumped right now. Don't got nothing to say. One of Ed's greatest strengths is his sense of conviction. He demonstrates this sense of conviction most clearly through his vast knowledge of animal agriculture. First of all, just generally the vegan point, I think it's, it's, it, you are, probably one of the most 
well-read, well-spoken people that I've ever run into on this point. Becoming as knowledgeable as Ed is a pipe dream for most people, but you can easily become more well-versed than almost every non-vegan you meet. I would genuinely love to have this debate. Can I like do a little more research and shit? The best way to quickly learn about the industry and the common excuses people use to justify consuming animal products is to read Earthling Ed's ebook, 30 Non-Vegan Excuses and How to Respond to Them. It only takes a few hours to read and Ed breaks down the top reasons people give to debunk veganism. We slaughter 80 billion land animals. When we factor in fish, it comes to 2 trillion. But 80 billion land animals every single year. 72 billion of them are chickens. Where are those 72 billion chickens and 80 billion in total land animals? How do they get here onto this planet? Another great way to become more knowledgeable is to watch slaughterhouse footage or go to a vigil. Watching footage isn't fun, but it's a great way to learn the standard practices of the industry. Not only will you learn a ton, but you'll also connect to the suffering of farm animals and be able to speak up for them with more confidence. But when it comes down to it, the real reason Ed is so confident during debates is experience. He spent the last seven years talking to non-vegans about veganism, and it shows. There's a difference between knowing what to say when you're debating and actually saying it. If you're not ready to talk to people in real life yet, you can practice online. The fourth technique Ed uses to win is that he keeps the conversation focused on animals and morality. Even though veganism is great for the environment and can provide health benefits, the heart of vegan philosophy is morality. Ed makes it clear that this is a moral issue by saying it outright. What is it about the treatment of animals that is a moral concern, do you think? This shows the other person where you stand and allows them to debate you on ethical terms, where the vegan argument is strongest. You said that the word ethical was not to harm in animals that are innocent. So cows are innocent, which means we can't kill them ethically. So why isn't it ethical to like raise them really well? And then when it's time to like kill them, you just take the cattle thing, yeah, shoot it in their head when they're not looking, and they instantly die. And then you have delicious food that's very healthy. Because it's not a necessity. So in the absence of necessity, to take the life of an animal would be an act of cruelty because they don't need to die, nor do they want to die. Non-vegans love to try to sidetrack the conversation so they can avoid being held accountable. But Ed always brings the conversation back to his original question. There's no quantifiable data, of course, to yeah. say that consuming a steak is going to increase your, um, your mental power. But just to bring it back to what we were saying, because I think what's, I, I, I kind of think maybe we've lost, we've, we've gone off on an interesting tangent, but a tangent that I think is kind of a little bit not so quantifiable mm -hmm. and a bit arbitrary maybe. So I'd like to bring it just back. And I'm just interested in establishing this kind of like chain of morality that you have again. Focusing on the animals allows Ed to stay rational and calm. It's important to remember that you're representing the animals. If you come across as overly emotional or unreasonable, you run the risk of pushing people away from veganism. By remembering that you're there for the animals, you can put your ego aside and are less likely to react emotionally to what the other person is saying, no matter how ridiculous it is. Mass killing of chickens is wrong, right? But you can kill an acceptable amount because What's an acceptable amount. So we say we say 72 billion is wrong. That's mass killing. How many is acceptable to kill? Enough to suffice the population per day. So, so the the number we currently kill then. Okay, yeah, then that one. 72 billion. So you have a limit. There is a point where it's no longer acceptable. If you but 72 okay, billion, that's, that's fine. Keeping the conversation focused on morality allows Ed to expose logical inconsistencies in the other person's position and ultimately win the debate. It's not someone. Are it's... animals not someone's? No, I feel like what someone, they? they're animals. But, but we, you by yourself said earlier that we're animals as well. We are, but we're, uh, now we're back to that whole thing. It's rare that you're going to get someone to go vegan after one conversation. However, if you can represent the vegan position calmly and politely, you've done your job. Make sure to end the conversation on a positive note and thank the other person for speaking with you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Eric. I appreciate it more than you know. So have a great day. All right. You may never be as eloquent as Ed, but by making people feel comfortable, adopting an attitude of curiosity, speaking with conviction, and focusing on the animals, you can become a powerful advocate for the animals too. If you're interested in street outreach but aren't sure where to start, watch the video to your left. If you enjoyed this, hit that thumbs up button and comment below. Special thanks to my morally superior patrons, Amy, Andy, Deepak, and Rebecca.